Hello everyone. We are going to discuss uh, managing anterior segment trauma in today's webinar. I am Aravind Roy. I am a cornea faculty at Tej Kohli Cornea Institute, Ali Prasad I Institute, India. We have no disclosures or conflicts of interest. As we start our uh, webinar, I would like you to indicate your position. We have a fair mix of ophthalmologists in practice and in training for our session today. And I'm sure all of us see a lot of trauma in our day-to-day -day ophthalmology practice. So when we talk about trauma, it is important that we understand the terminologies and the classifications that go with it. Ocular injuries can be broadly classified into open or closed globe injuries. And I would strongly recommend that people who see injuries try to also classify them so that we talk in standard notations. This is the most commonly accepted injury classification for ocular injuries. It is broadly categorized into open and closed globes. And there are subcategories of type, grade, pupil, and the zone. The Birmingham eye trauma terminology helps to standardize disease definitions and pathologies. As clinicians, it is very important to understand when we are using a clinical notation or a term, what do we mean by it? What is rupture? Rupture is a full thickness wound of the eyeball caused by a blunt object. And if it is a full thickness wound of the eyeball caused by a sharp object, then it is denoted as laceration. A penetrating injury is a projectile based injury that has an entrance wound. A perforating injury has two entries. One is an entrance and other is an exit wound. Before we start the discussion on trauma, it is also important to prognosticate and give a numerical score to the trauma at hand. The ocular trauma score helps in doing that. The ocular trauma score is calculated by a simple addition of the presenting vision and you deduct any additional pathology that the patient has. Suppose a patient has better than 2040 vision on presentation, then he would have a OTS of 100. And with that, if there is a rupture of the eyeball, then you deduct 23 from that. You are left with a balance of 77. Going by this example, the OTS category 3 would be the category of this patient. The OTS has five categories based on the sum point of raw scores. And as you can see on your screens, that gives you an idea of what percentage chance does this patient have of regaining the vision. So our patient who had 77 would have 41% chance of ending up with a vision of 2040. There are several pre-operative considerations in trauma, one of which is triage, where you need to prioritize your patient have a pre-operative assessment of the injury, order radiologic investigations, provide a gentle minimal globe distortions while these investigations are performed, use a protective shield, prepare for general anesthesia, counsel the patient, and of course document everything as this has several medical legal implications. So how often do you manage a case of corneal trauma? That's good to know that all of us who are in this discussion room have a fair exposure to a large number of trauma cases. And our discussion will also be mostly scenario based. When we perform an eye examination, look for the visual equity, accuracy of projection, the presence of foreign bodies, subconjunctival hemorrhages, the consensual light reflex is very important when you cannot visualize the anterior segment structures. Note the extent of the tear, any associated infiltrates, pupillary reactions or consensual reflexes. 
Broadly, there can be three zones on which the trauma will be. One is zone where it is restricted to the cornea. Zone two has a concomitant limbal involvement and zone three would have a posterior extension. So which intraocular antibiotics do you prefer if you suspect an intraocular foreign body? So probably it is good to understand why we are using broad spectrum antibiotics. Now, if you look at the table, we need to have a broad spectrum coverage for patients of trauma, especially those who have contaminated ocular injuries. Now, this is important because you need to give a wide range of protection for gram positive and gram negative bacteria, which is the commonest. And if you suspect an intraocular foreign body, clindamycin is the drug of choice. However, often trauma can have contamination with bacillus, therefore vancomycin is also preferable. So let us start with the simplest of injuries such as conjunctival lacerations. Normally they do not require surgical repair unless there is a large avulsed plaque or there is a distortion of the anatomy of the caruncle or the semilunar fold. When you repair these lacerations, it's important that one does not touch the tenons or disturb the tenons because that may lead to scarring or simplifying. This was a child who sustained a blunt trauma from a door knob. As you can see on the fluorescein stain picture, there is a wide area of epithelial defect and it remarkably healed with conservative management alone. More often than not, minor trauma can have a partial thickness tear. The caveats here are that the wound opposed, there is no gape, there is no leak. And when there is no leak or the apex is pointing down with minimal or no displacement of the lamellar tear, probably a bandage contact lens is all that is required. So it will need suturing when the tear edges are not opposed there is a gape, avulsion, or a flap with an apex up, or probably you are dealing with a pediatric case. It is very important that one looks for the wound integrity. Often, tears which would have a lamellar looking appearance may have micro leak. And once you put a drop of fluorescein, you will see the seedles being positive. Now, Seidel's test is very important to judge whether this wound requires any surgical intervention or not because a continuously leaking wound will provide a pathway for ingress of microorganisms and therefore infection of the eye. So how is the Seidel test performed and what percentage of fluorescein would somebody use for this test? That's correct. So one uses 2% fluorescein for the Seidel's test. Now let us look at this scenario where a child presented with a bird beak injury and we see the iris that has been stuck to the back of the cornea. And this is a slit section which shows the tenting of the iris. So this is a dilemma. As you can see, if you see the previous picture, you see that the visual axis is affected. There is iris in the wound, but it also appears to be well epithelialized. This was Seidel's negative. So a decision was made that let us allow it to scar. And as the tissue scarred, you can see that the visual axis is much clearer. And this child finally ended up with a visual acuity of 2040 with correction. Often you can also find a seal tear with an impacted metallic foreign body. Now these cause rupture of the tissues. So when there is a rupture as opposed to a laceration, the edges are very rough and often there might be minor amounts of tissue defects. When this happens, then just opposing the tissue with the suture is not going to work. One may need to use cyanoacrylate glue or other tissue adhesives with a bandage contact lens, which was done for this patient. And you can see on the first post-operative day, the chamber is well formed, 
the bandage contact lens is in place and the tissue adhesive is keeping the cornea tectonic support. This was another case where a patient presented with a wooden stick injury and you can see that there are a lot of infiltrates in the cornea and also there is a hypopion and chamber reaction. The injury was repaired but also it needed some amount of tissue adhesives but there was a relentless progression of the corneal infiltrate requiring therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty. So it's very important that the inciting foreign body can be a carrier of microorganisms and it is very vital and important that you remove it at the earliest and better still also send it in a culture media for microbiology assessment. Now let us come into the common ways in which you need to suture corneal tears. When you look at corneal tears, as discussed, we may be looking at full thickness tears or lamellar tears, whether they are small tears or larger tears, whether it could be simple tears or complicated tears. Simple tears are those which are restricted to the cornea, well opposed, they do not have iris or vitreous or lens incarcerated into them. The complicated tears may have a combination of all of these. So this patient was a young mechanic and while he was working, a power drill got damaged and a piece of it got impacted in his cornea. As you can see in the top left picture, you can see a portion of the drill that is cut out and impacted in the eye. As seen in the video on your left, the piece was quite large and it could not be brought out through the cornea alone and it is being delivered out intact through a limbal incision. However, the sharp metallic pieces cause laceration of the corneal tissue and in the bottom right picture you can see that the wound is very well opposed as shown by the post-op one month picture with a minor scar and the visual axis is well clear and also the anatomic integrity is well restored. So when you suture your cornea injuries and especially when you suture lacerations, it's important to take equidistant bites from the cuts so that you end up with a square shaped suture. And it should be 90% depth of the cornea so that there is no internal wound gain. There is no override. It is useful that when we deal with trauma that we use interrupted tenon nylon sutures. The advantage of this being that these sutures tend to have an elasticity and adjust with the tissue tension. If there is a loosening of those, then one suture can be removed at a time and they provide good apposition with minimum reaction of the underlying tissues. When you repair a cornea, it is vital that you oppose the corneal landmarks. This is a limbus to limbus tear caused by a blunt trauma. So when I'm repairing this, my first goal is to oppose the limbus. And if there are angulations in the corneal tear, then I try to join those angulations together. So I have two or three large straight segments. Once I have achieved that, then I try to close the gaps in between these by multiple interrupted sutures. Now, as you notice the way I am suturing, it, it is very useful that you give two one one knots or three one one knots. What I mean by that is that the first throw is of three throws around your time forceps so as to form a first knot. Look at this knot that is being given. And then the second knot is 90 degrees away from it. And, and your end point is when your knot starts becoming rounded. So when the knot is rounded, that's where you end. So the caveats are oppose the limbus, oppose angulations, oppose pigment lines, break down the tear into segments and then keep on dividing until you completely close the tear. 
the other important caveat in corneal tear repairs is understanding the zones of compression now when you put a suture on the cornea the each suture creates a zone of compression onto the cornea now the zone of compression is actually a square the diameter of which is equal to the length of the suture so so when you put large number of sutures which are smaller in size then automatically you have smaller zones of compression and you will need more number of sutures to close the same hole as opposed to when you take longer bites the longer bites would have larger zones of compression and when they and you will need smaller number of sutures to close the same same incision so how do you suture skeletal lacerations what do you think so that's correct you use all of the above you use bridging sutures first string and multiple sutures with tissue adhesives so this was a 31 year old assault victim who had injury with a glass piece from a broken bottle this was managed with interrupted sutures and also bridging sutures and this is how the idle at one month was stopped and then then the sutures are removed almost 4 to 6 months later and he is now uh, requested for a contact lens trial his unaided visual acuity is 20 by 320 so this is a first string suture that is being given i am sorry the video is uh, codex are not playing but this was another patient who had a trauma with a broken glass bottle and that ended up with a triradiate tear and we had to place a first string suture which uh, helped in sealing this wound together what what do you do if there is iris prolapse associated with corneal trauma so when there is iris prolapse it's important to excise the wound and whatever is the unhealthy or infected appearing iris tissue needs to be excised off however when excising be cautious to leave behind sufficient amount of tissue which can be repaired on a subsequent uh, intervention this was a young patient who sustained injury with a sharp edge of a bench and presented with almost 6 hours after the trauma now here you can see that there is a prolapse of the iris and it was reposited because the tissue appeared healthy and you can see that the pupil is almost rounded with some amount of peaking at the 11 11 30 o'clock and this was the one month post op and you can see that after the sutures have been removed the uh, tissue has scarred well i'm sorry this is the 3 month post op and the cornea is quite clear this patient had a unaided visual acuity of 20 30 so the other important consideration and also the controversy is that how do you manage lens trauma when there is a simultaneous corneal injury with a lens damage or rupture of the anterior capsule there are several schools of thought that one school of thought is that leave alone the lens don't touch it just close the corneal tear however this is not a universal concept if your visualization is good and you have adequate instrumentation then you can go ahead and also manage the lens at the same time during corneal trauma because multiple interventions increase your chance of doing in producing an element of infection and therefore you have to minimize the number of times that the patient 
is sent to the operating theater. If you are dealing with an intumescent cataract, if you are dealing with a cataract which has lots of loose, fluffy cortical matter disseminated across the anterior segment or a subluxated lens, then it is important that we should remo relieve, remove the nucleus at the same session. So this was a patient who presented with a penetrating corneal trauma. And as you can see, that the anterior lens, lens capsule is ruptured. And there is some amount of lens that matter that is stuck to the back of the cornea. This was managed by just placing some viscoelastic, pushing the lens matter away from the wound, clearing the wound, and then putting interrupted corneal sutures. He resolved beautifully, as you can see, and there are some loose cortical matter that is there, which will be managed secondary. So it is a surgeon's take that what kind of injury you are dealing with. If you are dealing with a lens that is not much disturbed, it is best you do not handle it. Because the visualization may be poor, the anatomy is distorted, and there might be a vitreous strand, you may start pulling, causing it a giant retinal tear. So it is very prudent that at that point of time you address the primary pathology at hand and leave alone the rest. So this is a video, I'm, I'm again sorry the videos are not playing, but what I'm performing here is I'm doing a lens aspiration and then this was another patient where he had a anterior traumatic subluxation and the entire lens was in the anterior chamber and was sticking to the back of the cornea. Here we performed a ICC type operation and we removed the entire lens in total with the back and then left the eye a fake so that a secondary procedure can be performed and we can place a intraocular lens in a second sitting. Because when we put a second sitting lens then it is much more controlled. Your, your cornea injury has been taken care of, the sutures are out, your keratometry would be much more regular compared to what it would have been with sutures. And here you can see there is a faint corneal scar where I have removed the sutures and now I have the bag which is intact and there is the PC from which you see the reflections and I'm, I can easily place a foldable IOL in the bag, giving the best possible vision to the patient. So when we are dealing with a suspected foreign body, that happens when you have a entry wound, there is an iris tract, there is a capsule rupture. When this happens, suspect that you are dealing with a intraocular foreign body, which is uh, in the bag or which is in the body of the lens. In those cases, these can be NIDAS for sus subsequent infection. In these cases, it is important to excise the lens in total, I'm sorry, to extract the lens in total and leave the eye affected and then look at the retina and if it needed, a secondary VR intervention can also be done. So what do you think of this case scenario? A 45-year-old housewife presenting with pain, redness and blurring following injury. Are we dealing with traumatic endophthalmitis over here? Is there a foreign body? We can't see any. There is something sticking on the anterior lens capsule. And what is this over there which is very suspicious? This is a lens abscess in evolution. Look at the B scan, look at the A scan. The, the line scan above is completely flat. This is a fakey chi. The B scan vitreous echoes are absolutely normal. You are looking at a potential lens abscess over here. There has been an entry wound. There has been a breach of the anterior capsule and something has been inoculated into the lens. And there is a nice, beautiful osseous ring that is there, that is formed on the anterior lens capsule. There is a hypopion. 
and there is no reaction in the vitreous. So it may evolve into a traumatic endophthalmitis, but at this point of time, your first differential is a lens abscess. This was a patient who presented with an injury with an iron piece. The visual acuity is as shown and it was removed promptly. Now, as we followed up the patient, some dirty infiltrate started appearing on the lens. This is a lens abscess. This is a potential to go into a full-blown traumatic endophthalmitis. Therefore, you should follow up your trauma cases closely. Watch for the lens. Watch for an inflammation that refuses to subside, an eye that continually remains inflamed or the vision starts dropping. In these cases, if you suspect the lens is getting affected or the B scan starts showing some echoes near the posterior lens capsule, then you should refer this to a BR surgeon. These are very important caveats and you need to be absolutely watchful that the lens abscess does not progress to a full traumatic endophthalmitis. A timely intervention such as a parsplanar lensectomy and a parsplanar vitrectomy may save the eye and change the prognosis completely into a much more favorable path. So this patient was referred to the VR surgeon and a PPL PPL was done. How do you handle vitreous that is presenting with the cornea loom? It's not uncommon to have penetrating injuries of the cornea with a strand of vitreous that is poking out of the eye. It is very important not to pull it. One of the common practices that residents in training do is that they use with cotton wicks to pick up vitreous strands. That practice has to be very strongly discouraged. Because when you do that, you are putting an element of traction onto the retina and you might end up with a giant retinal tear. It is very important to identify vitreous. Vitreous appears to be strands which are very clear and stringy. If you come across that, try to cut it flush with a vanus or an automated vitrector. And once you have cut it flush with the corneal surface, try to use a spatula to, to remove the vitreous from the wound. Once you have done that, use an automated vitrector. The automated vitrectomy is the best way to do vitrectomy as opposed to manual vitrectomy or open sky vitrectomy. And it is useful that one uses two ports rather than one single port. When you put your vitrector inside the eye, make sure that the port is not leaking. Because if it does, then along with the fluid, the vitreous may also get engaged in the port and you may end up causing more trouble than you intended to. So this was a patient who had an injury with a iron wire. So the wire had a whiplash motion cut through the cornea and you can see the iris sliced at 5 o'clock. There was a lens injury and there was a strand of vitreous as you can see with some amount of foreign bodies and debris that is sticking to it. So we did a localized vitrectomy and closed the corneal tear. And as you can see, I placed a air bubble in the anterior chamber. A small air bubble tends to be very mobile in the immediate post-operative period. And when that happens, any iris strand, any vitreous strand that is residual cannot attach to the posterior portion of the corneal wound. When that happens, it keeps your wound free from any strand that may reattach at the end of your surgery. This is important when you do your corneal tears and you suspect that there is incarceration of either the uvea or the vitreous into the wound. So as you can see in the split section, my posterior wound is very well opposed. There is a small air bubble on the superior uh, uh, part of the anterior chamber and the anterior chamber is very well formed. Document all of these findings on your first post-operative day. Make sure that nothing is sticking. And if you also find that there is something sticking to the back of the corneal wound, then make sure that you remove it because that 
continuously puts a traction onto the vitreous and the retina which may lead to either a cystoid macular edema or a more unfortunate scenario like a retinal tear how do you manage complex corneal tears where multiple zones are involved this was a patient who had a trauma with a glass piece that was a zone 1 zone 2 tear so it's important to first understand what are the anatomical landmarks that you are looking at when you are looking at anatomical landmarks the first thing you should do is oppose the limbus oppose any angulation so here i would oppose this part first and then i oppose the angulation over here then i am left with three straight segments segment 1 segment 2 and segment 3 once i have done that i will remove any prolapsed uvl tissue and after that it is very important to reform the chamber because if the chamber is not reformed then you will end up with peripheral anterior synechia with the angles fusing within a week's time and an intractable glaucoma on head so this was the presentation and this is how the patient looked on the first post operative day there is a traumatic cataract there is a irregular osseous ring some part of the iris was damaged therefore it has to be excised and sacrificed this was another interesting case where there was a limbal tear but it also had a tongue shaped corneal extension this is the part that i'm talking about and it is exactly the thickness of what a lasik plaque would look like so what do you do the the i the central cornea is pretty clear there is uh, absolutely no damage to the anterior segment structures this part is the conjunctiva which has covered the wound then this is after the surgery so it was a dilemma that should i remove this tongue shaped excision or should i keep it in position so we decided that it is always best to promote anatomic integrity so that the healing is faster and better and we placed six interrupted sutures there is one more suture here which is hidden under the conjunctiva and this was the presentation at one month when it had nicely epithelialized and those are the suture cracks because we have removed the sutures so when you are managing corneal tears with a avulsed flap make sure that the angulation is forward and towards the apex look at the fish tail kind of appearance that is here that provides a continuous element of stretch and it keeps the avulsed flap well stretched and tightly opposed to the cornea thereby promoting healing and reducing your astigmatism and promoting a healthy epithelialization so these are the caveats from this case it's very important to preserve anatomic continuity and oppose with the angulation towards the apex this was a patient which was again very interesting he was working with a darning needle a darning needle is actually a large needle which is used to sew gunny sacks and they are they are often 6 to 8 inches long and on presentation it appeared as if it's a simple zone one corneal tear until we suspected there is something which is appearing abnormal or funny on this part which is about the 5 6 o'clock i'm sorry 8 o'clock and when we exposed uh, the conjunctiva over this part there was a exit wound so now it is not only a penetrating corneal trauma but it's a perforating corneal trauma so look for exit wounds reform the chamber these are lacerations and often only a corneal suture is not going to do the job you may need additional tissue adhesives and that's what was done and a tissue adhesive was placed and you can see that the chamber is well formed this was the track and there are some stitches underneath which are covered by the conjunctiva and this is how the track had progressed from your 7 o'clock to 1 o'clock and the iris is also torn which will be repaired on a secondary procedure there are certain typical scenarios that one encounters when one sees trauma 
the commonest that we see in our practice is needle stick injuries it is not uncommon that there are syringes lying around and children while playing may poke their eyes and often it's a very sharp uh, needle so there will be a instant pain and then everything is okay but you will see that the child continuously has a red inflamed eye the vision starts dropping and you can see that there is a dirty white uh, exudate and this was a much advanced case and you can see that there is hypopia so this patient when and, and when we just looked we cajoled the child and started eliciting a history that there was a possible probable i would say needle stick injury while playing about a week earlier and where is the trachea ask the patient to look down and you can see that there is a closed sealed corneal entryone which might have poked the nucleus causing a lens sepsis and now it is a full blown endophthalmitis as was shown by the vitreous echos so the learning points that we had from this case was that there is a sealed cornea alone there is a continuously chronically inflamed eye yellowish pupillary exudates and vitreous echos and this is the ophthalmic emergency of first grade and you need to intervene immediately to save the eye and preserve the vision the other typical scenario in our practice is also bird beak injuries where children typically while playing with pets tend to be injured by the bird's beak when they play with pet birds now these injuries can be pretty lacerated damaged and grossly contaminated because the bird's beak is a very infected uh, uh, part and and when it pokes the eye it often inoculates a lot of microorganisms so it's again very typically seen in children though it can be seen with anyone there is often a gross laceration of the corneal tissue with expulsion of the intraocular contents they are very contaminated wounds so you need to give broad spectrum antibiotics you will often need vitretina support and badly damaged eyes may need a more aggressive surgical management so what what should we do if the cornea wound is grossly irreparable if you are looking at a eye which looks like this this was a child who had a injury with a blunt end of a umbrella and as you can see very unfortunately most of the intraocular contents are out and they are just blood clots and uh, obviously the child is in a lot of pain there is no perception of light what do you do over here definitely the first step would be to assess and counsel the family prognosticate that is important that probably we are looking at a very guarded visual prognosis over here in this scenario and it's also important that you try a primary acquisition because often these eyes which are given up as very bad may have some residual vision in them but even if they do not it is very important that the eye remains so that there is a psychological factor of well being the event of trauma is a extremely emotional one for both the patient and the family and if it is also associated with the loss of the eye with an anophthalmic socket then those can cause severe trauma severe emotional pain and distress to both the patient and the family so sometimes it's very important to just go for a primary apposition so even if the eye is thysical and small the eye is in the socket and a custom ocular prosthesis can be planned at a subsequent stage so with this i will close the talk and invite comments and discussions so please send me your questions we have some questions now so let us start with the first one So when do we call it uveal incarceration and when do we call it uveal prolapse? So uveal prolapse is when you have the uveal tissue projecting out of the eye, 
and incarceration is when it is entangled in the wound so when it is inside the wound it's incarceration and yes prolapse is a type of incarceration that but the tissue is out of the eye or rather out of the anatomical boundaries the other question is in case of traumatic cataract when do we place the intraocular lens you have to look at the age of the patient if you are if you are handling a pediatric patient who is less than 2 years old then amblyopia is going to set in pretty early you need to rehabilitate the patient so that amblyopia does not occur now that can be done in several ways there are ways of calculating iol for that age group and you also have to understand that you are not doing a congenital cataract surgery over here but you are do you are performing a iol surgery in a inflamed eye so allow the blood aqueous barrier to settle down and once that happens then go on and place a iol the other question was following post uh, sorry following post foreign body removal how we managed the lens sepsis yes it's managed in some way like endophthalmitis so you are correct that we manage it like endophthalmitis but at that point of time endophthalmitis has not evolved at that point of time it is just a a lens sepsis in evolution you see a foreign body a closed cornea or a open cornea wound a lens which appears to have uh, dirty appearing infiltrates pupillary membranes and the b scan shows anechoic vitreous so the other question is if the patient has corneal perforation traumatic cataract vitreous loss so what are the procedures that we can do during primary repair so when there is a traumatic cataract and vitreous loss if the lens the corneal perforation of course has to be repaired first the second thing is about the cataract now if you are sure that your view is good you can manage the cataract go ahead and remove the cataract but at that point of time do not be very aggressive because there is also a component of vitreous loss so if you encounter vitreous during the repair then do a automated vitrectomy and once that is done leave the eye affected so that the vr surgeons can take a look of the retina once the corneal edema settles down now your second question is how long do we give intravitreal antibiotics probably if the vitreous is clear and you are not looking at a traumatic endophthalmitis you do not need to give intravitreal antibiotics beyond the first procedure when you are repairing it during the primary repair of the corneal tear and it is also important as i discussed at the beginning of my talk that you need to give a broad spectrum empirical antibiotics either orally or intravenously for a duration of one week when that happens the the bugs are automatically taken care of so you do not need to give for a long time in a in a tear which appears to be sterile the next question is that in case of irreparable globe injury are there chances of sympathetic ophthalmia of course yes that is one of your major uh, considerations you would have that risk happening and you should document it in your record that you have explained in the patient's language in the patient's record that there is a chance of sympathetic ophthalmia what is your preferred method of managing lens sepsis so i i am an anterior segment surgeon so i do not uh, handle lens sepsis i believe that the lens sepsis is best managed by a vitreoretina surgeon where you go by a pars plana approach you perform a complete pars plana lensectomy and a pars plana vitreoretomy and aggressively remove all contaminated or suspicious contaminated appearing tissue and place antibiotics so one of our attendees wants to discuss the zones of trauma so i would strongly recommend you to read the article from american journal of ophthalmology on 
open and closed lobe injuries there are subtypes in it where each type of corneal or for that matter anterior segment trauma is classified broadly into open and closed lobe injuries and then there are subtypes based on the zones the type the grade of visual acuity pupil so zones if you want to understand simply zones are if it is restricted to the cornea it is zone 1 if it is restricted from the cornea and also 5 mm away from the limbus then that is zone 2 anything beyond that is zone 3 if the iris prolapse around 24 hours ago should we remove it or keep it okay so it it is again a very tricky question you have to traditional teaching tells us that if the iris is collapsed out of the eye beyond 24 hours if it appears necrosed if it appears macerated if it appears to be infected excise it send it for microbiology however there can be clean cut wounds which are more than 24 hours and they are just covered by a fibrin membrane and once you gently dissect off the fibrin on table you find that the underlying iris is healthy you can put it back also would you repair a corneal laceration in the presence of a lens abscess absolutely yes we have to repair a corneal laceration if the laceration is leaking as i showed you during the end of my talk of a child who had a lens abscess but a sealed corneal tear a sealed corneal tear need not be repaired but what happens during the surgery is that when we are revising the wound or when we are doing the lens abscess management often the corneal tear also opens up and if that happens then probably a few stitches are needed to oppose the cornea what is your choice of antibiotic prophylaxis and which route is effective the intravenous antibiotics are most effective if you do not have access for that then try oral fluoroquinolone such as ciprofloxacin and uh, go for broad spectrum antibiotics such as vancomycin or clindamycin because wounds can be contaminated then following trauma a lady presented 4 months after an anterior chamber was full of uh, exudates so here in this is a difficult case because this is 4 months after trauma so we really do not know if these are sequelae of trauma or we are dealing with a chronic endophthalmitis or a persistently inflamed chamber so if there is anatomic integrity is maintained then go ahead and do a b scan ultrasonograph and see what is happening to the posterior segment if there is a posterior segment pathology treat it if it is purely a inflammation treat as per inflammation and if you suspect that there is infection then take some of that infiltrate uh, or the pus that is there and the exudates that are there for microbiology and treat as per microbiology the other question is that how do you determine if the iris tissue is healthy or not healthy the iris tissue has a particular color there it also has a particular consistency and it also has a particular tone so if all of these are there then probably you are dealing with a healthy tissue if not if it is grossly macerated the anatomy is discontinuous there is lacerations the iris appears to be friable the iris appears to be sciced the layers of the iris have separated and they are tattered and this is the iris that you would need to excise off for the last patient with severe damage and ex extrusion of intraocular material uh okay you uh, the last patient actually had a lot of intraocular contents excised off and there was no tissue loss fortunately so we could manage to close the 
kid uh, nail wound i posed as was shown in the last picture but there was a consistent hypotony there was gross damage to the eyeball so it slowly went into thysis then would you recommend primary lensectomy in traumatic cataracts no not really we have to access uh, we have to reassess sorry what is the type of lens injury that we are dealing with if our lens injury is minimal then the normal human lens not only helps in vision it also helps in accommodation so as far as possible do not fiddle with the lens if a traumatic cataract is evolving there is a high chance of that becoming intumescent there is a high chance that there may be cortical remnants that may spill over into the anterior chamber causing an anaphylactic reaction definitely do a primary lensectomy the third caveat here is that if you are dealing with the lens make sure your visualization is good there is no point of going ahead and handling the lens and leaving behind a large rim of lenticular material underneath the iris because the pupils are constricted in trauma the view is limited the cornea has edema there might be posterior capsular damage there might be vitreous in the wound and if all of these are there then handling the lens may cause more damage to the eye than benefit whereas you can always go ahead and do a secondary procedure also the second the other question is how do you approach a scleral wound beyond the limbus under the conjunctiva so this is a very very good question that the attendee has asked this is very important if you remember the case that i showed you with a darning needle now you can see that there is a entry wound and there is a exit wound so you need to suspect that see you are seeing a track a entry wound you are seeing a corresponding tear in the iris you are seeing something which is uh, brownish underneath the conjunctiva and you cannot see the end point of that tear that means that this tear does not end here and there you have to excise your conjunctiva and you have to follow the track of the wound until you reach the end of the uh, tear now if it is very posterior please call your vitretna colleague and there are certain tears which pass very beyond the equator and they cannot be seen so there you need to tie silk sutures to the rectus muscle and then turn the globe down and actually track so wound exploration is extremely important in trauma to make sure that you close down all open wounds so it's a very very important question that you asked okay shall we leave aphakic all traumatic cataracts in children and i answered this question earlier that you need to rehabilitate visually and for that you need to keep them aphakic for a time point and then at the earliest possible setting you need to implant the intraocular lens go for a contact lens do a examination under anesthesia do a refraction and make sure that amblyopia does not set in because that defeats the whole purpose of the surgery that what is the point of having anatomic continuity when the eye does not have physiological function okay now for the young patients if we don't remove lens how long it can go to amblyopia well uh, it depends on the age of the patient so um, my understanding is that you want to know that how long you can keep the eye uh, how aphakic right so i i think that you need to be uh, very vigilant of the fact that the younger the child the more high likelihood of the child developing amblyopia so you need to do a examination and anesthesia do a refraction allow the uh, blood aqueous barrier to settle the good part is that cornea wounds in children tend to settle down and heal very fast so in 6 weeks we can remove the stitches and probably by 8 to 12 weeks you can strongly consider putting the patient 
uh, with uh, a intraocular lens. However, you also need to consult your pediatric ophthalmologist and take the best practices into concern. The amblyopic uh, eye also recovers fast in these children because the visual system is much more plastic at that age group. So I hope I have answered your question.